Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I am Valerie Satagat, Artistic Director of the San Francisco Girls Chorus, and I am sharing this virtual stage tonight with Celine Ritchie. She's a singer, stage director, and Artistic Director of Ars Minerva. Good evening, Celine. Good evening, Valerie. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, this uh, great collaboration between the Ars Minerva and the San Francisco Girls Chorus. Um, I'm really delighted about this and I can't wait to go forward with the project. Yes, exactly. So well, we didn't have the choice, we just had to do it virtually. And of course, we weren't able to present an entire opera you know, virtually, but it was so important for our singers to know this piece, Yudita Triumphant by Vivaldi, um, and keep working not only on the styles, on knowing the different arias, uh, knowing the different choruses and, and know the story too. Uh, be, but before we you know, dive in a little bit more uh, uh, on the, in the, into the project, do you mind giving us a little bit more details about your organization, Ars Minerva, that you founded? Yes, of course. Um, so just to, le to give a little bit of background, uh, I started my career as an opera singer specialized in Baroque music. Um, and so I had the opportunity to sing with several um, Baroque ensembles in the world. Um, and one of the, I mean, the projects I've been always uh, very uh, um, fascinated by were when I was involved into opera recreations, mm -hmm. meaning uh, performing operas that hadn't been performed since their creation uh, in the Baroque time. And so I've created Ars Minerva in 2013, uh, and our main mission is to bring back forgotten operas to life. Um, and for now, we have uh, brought back five operas uh, that were not played since the 17th century or the 18th century. Um, like our first opera, La Cleopatra, composed by Daniele da Castrovillari, was first created in 1665 for the carnival in Venice and never played since. Um, and so this is uh, really uh, the, the heart of Ars Minerva work. Uh, we are also very uh, happy to collaborate with um, Bay Area artists and uh, that embrace fully the recreation process and we are happy that we have uh, also a very enthusiastic audience. Um, so this is mainly the work uh, of Ars Minerva and we hope that in the future, in the real life, we're going to uh, recreate more operas. Great, yes. And, and for us, you know, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, for, for those who, who, who don't know us a lot, the San Francisco Girls Chorus has a, a, an ensemble, the premier ensemble. This year we have 56 singers uh, and, and we are uh, working a lot with, uh, you know, um, encouraging commissions and working a lot uh, around new music. But because we are also a place where our singers are trained and some of them want to be singers, we want to make sure that they know uh, the different styles and, and, uh, of music and know music history. And so it is very important that uh, they also are able to, to, to sing Baroque music, for example. So this is why we, we chose to have a, a, a project with, with you uh, this year uh, around Gilita Triumphants. So, Judith Triumphants, written by Vivaldi, uh, written for those young ladies from the, uh, the orphanage in Venice. And um, it was so interesting to me just to see that we could actually, um, you know, use the fact that we were all isolated uh, and create this piece, knowing that those young girls in those orphanages were also uh, isolated. So instead of trying to recreate the entire opera virtually, uh, we've decided to create a video project. So uh, Celine, would you like to, to share a little bit uh, about that before we see it? Yes. Um, so the idea, um, actually, generally in my work, uh, I like very much uh, to establish a thread between the past and nowadays. Um, I call it the human journey and uh, like, history repeats or there's like a link, a human link between us uh, through centuries, right? 
And so there is uh, the story of Judith that is in the Bible. Uh, and uh, so the Bible speaks about it. And Judith um, is, uh, is a Betulian widow. And Betulia is attacked by the Assyrians and the, their general is Olofernes. And so Judith, um, really very, very brave, uh, take the decision uh, to go to their, the camp of the Assyrians and wants to strike back Olofernes, and she does, by cutting his head, right? And so the war's finished. And then some centuries later, <laughs> Uh, of course, this is a this is a story that is very uh, powerful, and that many people, also painters, have um, shown in their work. But uh, here, what we are interested in is this work by Antonio Vivaldi that he wrote in 16, uh, 1716, Sorry, it was created in seventeen sixteen by the orphan of La Pietà. And so there, there, there is this uh, second layer, right, of 1716. And then there is today, uh, 2020, <laughs> San Francisco. So we go from Betulia to Venice to San Francisco. Um, and so to me, the story of Judith is also um, a heritage of um, a legacy of empowerment and strength uh, that women passed each other right through centuries. And so through these videos, uh, video, um, the main work for now to me was to show uh, the link between the, the uh, chorister of the San Francisco uh, Girls Chorus, the link they have to the orphan of La Pietà who were the same age, and also the link they have with Judith and I've been um, really very surprised by their very mature reactions uh, when they speak uh, about, oh, Judith, she's so modern and she's in charge, she's competent. She's not the side character of a male hero. She's the heroine and she's in charge. Um, she doesn't sit around waiting for something to happen, right? Uh, so this is, is of course, um, very rewarding uh, to hear uh, and that actually as women, we can have a, a role model of a strong woman, mm -hmm. right? Like for example, Joan of Arc uh, in, in another way, uh, but not a woman that is waiting around. Um, and then the orphan at La Pietà uh, that were cloistered, uh, during their whole life. And we know that if they decided to marry, they couldn't anymore perform. So it was a heavy choice for them. And so I was also very surprised to see how the chorister, our chorister are reacting to that. And again, uh, what they say very mature, um, like they, they establish this link of this passion that they have, like those orphans, but they also say, they were not free. And so how does passion and freedom work together, right? Um, so this is, was also um, a great discovery in such a young person, right? And, and also, so the girls at La Pietà were cloistered and the, the, the San Francisco Girls Chorus for now is locked down. So there is also this element of solitude uh, mm -hmm. and how are they going to interact with this huge piece <laughs> that is very difficult on so many levels and how they, they can see themselves through the girls of La Pietà who also had to go through this story of empowerment and strength in a way also closed on themselves. And um, so I hope that in the future, when we will do it in real life, we will be able to explore uh, those levels also um, on stage and go deeper in that search. Great, thank you. And, and I would like to mention also, you know, on the musical side, of course, each of them had to learn their part um, uh, during rehearsal, of course, during our, our Zoom <laughs> rehearsal time. But it's true that uh, at one point they had to uh, be in charge and record their own video 
uh, and know they are, yeah, we, we had the support also of uh, Corey Jemison who, who played the harpsichord and who also gave them two master classes to, to help them uh, uh, practice, you know, their, their part. Uh, I would like now to, um, to, to call and invite with us uh, Jolly Greenleaf. Jolly is an um, artistic director of the Tenet Vocal uh, Artist, and uh, she's based in New York. And um, as you know, when we, we are not in person, we can't sing together, but one of the solutions that we, uh, we found very interesting for, to, to empower our young uh, women was to invite different guest artists and, and be able to have them surrounded by music and by artistry and expertise. And so Jolly uh, is with us this year uh, to work, especially with um, part of our uh, ensemble. You know, I talked about those 56 singers, but part of those um, in the, the 56 singers, we have 20 of them who are in a program called the Soloist Intensive, which, which is led by Justin Morty at the Girls' Chorus. And so Jolly, uh, welcome. Thank you for being with us. And um, jo Jolly had the opportunity to, to work with our singers. But maybe before we, um, we have a little bit more details uh, about you know, what you, you've done with them, would you uh, mind reminding us uh, what, what, what are you doing with Tenet? Which kind of project do you develop? Yeah, I, I hope um, some folks might remember that we did a collaborative project before, also um, featuring music by 17th century Italian nuns. And um, I just love the project that you're working on now because there's so many wonderful threads there. Um, and Tenet, as an ensemble, you know, we've had a long love of the music of Claudio Monteverdi and uh, especially the music from his time in Venice. So there are so many wonderful links here. It's, it's really such an honor to work with the girls, uh, continue to work with the girls on this repertoire. Um, and at the moment, Tenet is, uh, we're also on lockdown just like everyone else. We had some low case number windows in the summer and we were able to make a good number of intimate recordings with anywhere from one to four voices or one to four parts. So that could be four singers, it could be one singer with instrumentalists. And so we released a series of recitals uh, for our audience that Thankfully, anybody can attend because it's now possible from anywhere. And so beginning in September and through the end of this year, every week we're offering um, an intimate program. And really, truly really the greatest part of that, besides being able to present music that we might not otherwise be able to present because of its intimate nature and the costs of doing those things in person, it just really, it opened our world to a lot of different repertoire and it gave so many wonderful opportunities to artists that have been struggling to figure out how do they still stay hopeful? How do they stay fresh? How can they keep practicing? Which are all the struggles that we as professional musicians are thinking about. And I'm sure that it's one of the struggles that the girls have as well. Like, why am I practicing? What am I doing all this for? And the answer is, you know, because there is a future and because it also brings so much joy to us as individuals when we do it. It's a little like going to the gym, but even better in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So much better. So you feel so much better afterwards, um, even though getting started can be really challenging. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And so um, you you worked with the with our singers. You had a master class with us. Do, do you want to share a little bit how it was for you? Uh, what, what? How was it? <laughs> it was a joy. It was an absolute joy. My colleagues Molly Quinn and Virginia Warnkin Kelsey joined me, and man, these girls are just fantastic. They were really beautifully prepared. They seemed to genuinely understand and love the music that we uh, helped curate for them. And they presented themselves so well, especially given the obstacles they were facing. They, in their own space, had to turn on a pre-recorded accompaniment and then ensure that they were always singing with that accompaniment which is something as professional singers, we often don't do. We're, we're able to count on our continuo instruments, our accompanied instruments to um, partner with us and align with us in such a way that if we need an extra time for a breath or we, uh, we wanna make something more of a note, we can do that. And these girls did such a beautiful job despite the foundation or the structure that they were uh, forced to 
stay within. Um, so all three of us, Molly, Virginia, and I were just incredibly impressed with what they did for us last night. And we gave them lots of great feedback and hopefully, um, hopefully they felt that they got something from it. We sure did. <laughs> great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you. You chose three pieces. Um, uh, do you, can, can you share a little bit about those three pieces? Uh, some of them are by Barbara Strozzi. Yes, absolutely. So Barbara Strozzi um, celebrated an anniversary year, 400th mm -hmm. anniversary year last year. And it was a wonderful opportunity for a lot of people to sort of get excited about her music and many performances were happening of it. So I chose two works for them to sort of just give a taste of, of some of what she has to offer. I mean, she has an incredible wealth of, of music to offer. Interestingly, Barbara Strozzi's music is um, is all secular, which is unusual for women at the time. Most women who were afforded an opportunity to compose were doing that within the convent, and they were usually doing it exclusively for secular or sacred music. Um, so Barbara Strozzi, she had a really a different life, a diff very different and interesting life. Um, I wrote some program notes about it, so hopefully that will be uh, shared at some point. Così non la voglio is one. And one of the things I love about Barbara Strozzi's music is that sometimes her texts are quite, um, well, she stands up for what she's thinking and she just puts it out there. It can be sassy, it can be really fun. Um, and in this case, uh, it's, you know, I don't want any of that. You know, uh, all this talk of love, all these promises made, no, 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 no. it's not going to work for me. And that's kind of fun. It's a nice sort of strong female perspective when we're used to hearing so many texts that are just swimming in the ideas of love or pained because someone has left you and, and you know, the sort of typical text that we see a lot. And then the other was a duet. And the duet was really sort of a, a, a lovely explosion of, um, of ideas around the idea of fortune uh, and creating harmony together. Um, and that's kind of a lovely thing at this moment in time as well, trying to, you know, having two voices come together in, in dialogue and in, in beautiful duet uh, writing and singing about not just love, but just like the idea of uh, overall good fortune coming together, building things together. So that's that, those were the pieces by Barbara Strozzi. And then there was one other piece by um, Isabella Leonarda. She's celebrating an anniversary year this year as well, 400th. So there's been a lot of talk about her. She was an incredible nun who started at the beginnings of her um, entrance into the convent. She, uh, I think she was 81 when she passed away and she had a very long history in the convent and one that um, she really got to the highest possible positions within the structure. And yet she also composed a lot of music um, and she, her music is very devotional. And what's so interesting about the, the nun's music in general and also Leonardo's music in particular is that there's such a personalized devotion. It's very, um, it, it's not uh, the typical kinds of texts that just say, um, you know, Jesus is wonderful. It's like, Jesus is so wonderful to me because, and then you get this list of why that particular uh, singer is so madly in love with Jesus. And, you know, we know that at that period, people were very devout, but at the same time, it was a little bit of a form of self-expression as well. I mean, these, uh, these women who were put into convents, we know that they had lots of different things happening in their lives. And surely there were times when they happened to fall in love with someone, but this was the avenue when they could express how they felt. Um, and it all had to be through the context of the, the sacred texts. So it's, it's really fascinating to see these very expressive women writing this music that, um, that sounds as if it were a secular love aria. Great. Well, that's wonderful. I'm just, uh, really, really excited to see that we were able to surround our singers by strong women, uh, not only as instructor artists such as you both, but also to have them give them the opportunity to discover those strong and, and powerful women and for Judita warrior women <laughs> even. Um, 
Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us both and um, uh, enjoy this wonderful evening. Join us in the chat, everybody, and we will see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The orphanage of La Pieta was an orphanage in 14th century Venice um, for illegitimate, abandoned, and orphaned girls. And there were a lot of orphanages around Venice at the time, but the interesting thing about this one was that this one was all about music. And every single girl who stayed there had an instrument, whether she sang or played like the oboe or the flute, and they would make music all the time. and conductors and composers would come from Venice to teach these girls and they wouldn't last very long because the girls were all very troublesome. But um, one of the composers slash conductors was Vivaldi. And so after he wrote so many songs for them, they got to be known as Vivaldi's girls. And these girls, the choir and the instrumental people would go all over Venice to churches all over Venice and they would perform, um, except they could never be seen while they performed because they were illegitimate girls and they weren't supposed to be seen because it's the 14th century. And so they would be behind the wooden pews in the churches that they couldn't be seen, but they could be heard really well. orphanage was around 40 to 60 students, so it's almost the same size as the Premier Ensemble, and their situation of being cloistered at the orphanage is actually really comparable to being in quarantine and cut off from the rest of the world. I think it's really cool that we're going to get to bring like new life to such an old piece. I really like that Vivaldi took pre-existing characters from the Bible and gave them more complex emotions and motives because a lot of the time in the Bible, the women are really two-dimensional. So Judith is from Betulia in Israel and the Assyrians were coming to defeat the Betulians. And Judith decides to save her city by using her beauty and charm to seduce the drunk Assyrian army general, Olofernes. She then cuts off his head and brings it back to the Betulians as a symbol of victory. And the Israelites are therefore able to drive the enemy Assyrians away. I'm super happy to have the role of Judith. To see an independent woman go and be the savior and be the hero in such a powerful way, I think, is something that's really special and it makes me really excited to perform this opera. Insomno profundo si agit in merzus, non am più sit vigil, non am più sit vigil, qui She's so clever, daring, courageous, and really devoted to her faith. It's usually the woman, you know, finding her lover and getting married and having a happily ever after. But I like how in this story, uh, that's not the case.
The role that I am playing is Olofernes, and it's the role of a man in a female range, and it's written for a woman, which is so inspiring to me because in this production, they didn't need any men to play the strong men roles. I get to break gender norms and I get to break female expectations. <laughs> I think I can relate to these young women at the orphanage. Music is the most important thing to them and it's the way that they get through their day and it gives them hope, which is something that I've related to a lot. 
I think quarantine gives some sense of being trapped, but I also think that there's a huge difference in their possible career paths. Because if the girls want to pursue music in the orphanage, they have to stay there their whole life. And if we do, we can just laureate from chorus and choose how we want to study music. It's really admirable how they were able to commit to something and sacrifice so much just for music. But I think it's really sad that the girls had to give up so much um, to do music because I really do think that music is about that freedom and creativity and self-expression and being limited just because of the circumstances of society I think is really sad. I don't think I could ever stay in one place in order to do what I love, which is to sing. Um, but I totally respect that that's something they want to do. I think that pursuing passion, a lot about that is about having the freedom to kind of go where you want with that, and they didn't get that. I can definitely empathize with them about just the sisterhood that comes with being with so many women and doing like groundbreaking things in music with women, you know, that really forms a bond that you really cannot find anywhere else. And I'm sure they experienced it at the orphanage all those years ago.
reach your